when most of us think about the best games on the Sega Genesis, we conjure up images of Contra, Shinobi, Castlevania, Streets of Rage, and Fantasy Star. These titles looked and sounded great, mainly because of the talented people that developed them, but also partially because the cartridges they came on were larger than most of what we had seen the previous generation. That extra space allowed for content like more sound effects, better animation, larger stages, and far more variety in all other areas of the presentation. It didn't guarantee a great game, of course, but it did give developers more freedom to create games far more complex than the generation before. But what about the 16-bit titles that came on tiny cartridges no larger than a megabit or two? Did they suffer immeasurably to the point where they are easily dismissed today? That's the subject of the video you are about to see. I go over some of the smallest Genesis cartridges and give you an idea of what you can expect. All these games tended to be simple in design, but that didn't mean they weren't without their appeal. We've got over 20 titles to go over, so let's get started. The 1991 release of Art Alive starts off the list with a whimper. This was a single megabit and it shows in every way. The gem's music has no variety, the art assets are simple and not particularly well animated. That leaves the base game of creating your own images, which is just simple coloring tools to draw with. But the real kicker here is, is that Sega charged $40 for this at its release and did not include a battery backup to save your work. So not only was it overpriced for a tiny cartridge with limited content, but it didn't even provide a way for you to keep what you had created. The developers even had a hell of a laugh in the instruction manual, advising you to use a VCR to tape your creations. Sometimes you have to wonder just what the hell Sega was thinking with this crap. Even Nintendo had the good sense to give you a save option in Mario Paint. This was an embarrassing release that offers little beyond a moment's curiosity. Nineteen ninety one also brought us the Electronic Arts published Blockout, a Tetris clone with one big difference you play it in three D. This looks down on the play grid from above, and you must complete floors in order to score. Like Tetris, things get fast and you die when the blocks reach the top of the screen. It takes quite some getting used to because you rotate and spin the pieces completely in 3D as well, so the difficulty is high right from the get-go. Fortunately, each floor is color-coded to help you distinguish the three-dimensional depth. This was also a one megabit cartridge, so the single screen visuals never change and there's no real music to speak of. But what it lacks in visual and sound variety, it makes up for in a gameplay model that is actually incredibly interesting. Unlike other falling block ripoffs, this actually feels distinctly different from the standard Tetris formula. It's a formula that itself has been ripped off countless times since, but I still find it quite playable. And speaking of falling block puzzle games, Sega's Columns makes the list itself, coming in at just a single megabit. Released in 1990 and originally part of Sega's download service in Japan, it's one of the most recognizable properties on the platform. This one really doesn't need an explanation. If you are a Genesis fan, you are well aware of its gameplay. Match the same jewels together in pairs of three to get rid of them. The best mode here is Flash Columns, where you must break the flashing gem that is buried under a mountain of regular gems. While the single screen visuals are quite tame and never really change, there are some nice music selections here that sound great. There's not a lot to this one content-wise, but if you like puzzle action, you can do a lot worse. Nineteen 
Fatal Labyrinth also began life in Japan in 1990 as a downloadable game for Sega's modem service. Developed internally by Sega CS, this is a turn-based RPG that appears to be a standard adventure title. But every move you make is a turn. Move a block, it's a turn. Attack, it's a turn. And you need to keep that in mind when you play it because this is not a Zelda clone despite its initial appearance. The Castle of Doom has appeared and you have volunteered to save the day. The cool thing is, is that the floors and the items reset every time you play it. No two games will ever be the same. If you can get used to the way it plays, that actually makes for a great setup because it breaks free of the usual RPG restrictions of the same content over and over. I've had games where I have found great weapons and armor really fast, and I've had games where I was poisoned instantly, surrounded by enemies, and killed in seconds. Of course, since it was a downloadable game in 1990, it was tiny and the sound and visuals do not have much in the way of variety. When this was brought west, Sega dumped it on a 1 megabit cartridge and sold it for $40. A tad overpriced, but give it a chance and it might surprise you. Wrapping up our games that came from Sega's Japanese download service, we have 1991's Flicky, a port of the classic arcade title of the same name. Your job is to rescue little birds from cats trying to eat them. Collect them and get them to the exit as quickly as possible. While the screen appears to scroll, it actually just wraps around itself, which adds to the challenge because the enemies are always a step away from killing you. Like the other downloadable titles here, the visuals are super simple in both variety and animation. There's pretty much just one song that plays during the action, and there's no story to speak of. You do get some bonus stages to help, but this one is either going to appeal to you for its simplicity, or it's going to drive you away because of it. Sega also brought this west on a physical 1 megabit cartridge and charged $40 for it. Grossly overpriced, but still a fun one that follows the arcade original quite closely. In 1990, Accolade released an unlicensed Genesis game called Ishido The Way of Stones, a puzzle board game where you match pieces of various colors and shapes. What initially appears to be incredibly simple winds up being very difficult. You need a strategy to win here because you can only match the same colors and shapes or a mixture of the two to one another. This makes matching three and four tiles extremely challenging. I've dumped hours into this and still regularly fail before completing a board. There is some variety in the play areas and colors, but overall this is quite tame when it comes to visuals and sound. The 1 megabit cartridge also happens to be one of the most notorious games on the Genesis because it fails the TMSS security on later releases of the console. That means it's utterly useless to most Genesis owners. I recommend you try this out via emulation or a flash device if you're not a collector, but whichever way you decide to go, at least give it a shot. It doesn't look it, but there's hours of challenge here to enjoy. In 1991, Tengen released Miss Pac-Man for the Genesis. This coming on a 1 megabit cartridge should come as no surprise. It's a simple game with not a lot of music and the single screen visuals only really change up color palettes. But this manages to do quite a bit with a very limited amount of space. You can use a speed boost, change mazes to some pretty wacky layouts, and it still manages to retain the cinematics. The gameplay definitely feels different, but this one is still fun if you enjoyed any of the other renditions of this famous franchise.
The first time I saw Shove It for the Genesis, I thought that it had to be a mistake. Surely this was the Master System version screens. I mean, it looks nothing like the usual quality the Genesis was known for. Coming in at a single megabit, 16-bit games do not get any simpler than this. It was released in 1990 and developed by NCS, and the subtitle says it all. The Warehouse Game. Yep, you are pushing boxes in this one, and the only thing you need to worry about is getting each one to the designated spot. You can't pull the boxes, so you have to get creative with how you push them around, and believe it or not, it can pass a few hours while you try and finish it. That one megabit of space is used for some very simple visuals, a song or two, and a single cinematic in between the levels. If you are looking for excitement, you won't find it here, but it's not a throwaway either. Puzzle fans may find a lot to like about it. Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle was a 2 megabit budget title on the Genesis when it was released in 1990, developed internally by Sega themselves. Now I have covered this a number of times on my channel and trashed it every single time. I do not like it. Period. So instead of retreading the same path, let me just describe to you what that 2 megabits of space is gonna get you. You'll get gameplay that makes 8-bit games look advanced mechanically. Very simple animation adorns every aspect of the presentation. Your punch and jump are little more than two frames playing out. The same goes for the enemies. You do get a handful of simple tunes to listen to, but outside of that, this is about as bare bones as early Sega made Genesis games get. There are some out there that appreciate these simplistic charms, but of that early batch of releases, it was my least favorite by a mile. The fact that the 2 megabit hard driving exists on the Genesis at all is rather impressive. As you know, this is brute force polygon rendering, and it is, at the very least, playable. But it's also ugly. The low frame rate and simple models are rough, and going back to this is much harder than the traditional 2D presentation the Genesis is known for. That leaves this one for those that enjoyed the arcade original on which it's based. If you found the simple mechanics and stunts appealing there, much of that is still here, just a bit more unattractive. There was a sequel in the way of race driving a few years later that expanded on its content quite a bit, so look for it there as well. Do you remember RC Pro-Am on the NES? Well, in 1992, the Genesis got sort of a remake of that game called Championship Pro-Am. For the most part, it looks and plays the same, which doesn't say much in the favor of the 16-bit version. The 2 megabit cartridge that it came on didn't really have much in the way of enhancements. It's still one player, the tracks are super simple in design, and short on details. And there's hardly any music to speak of outside of the title screen. But I must admit, despite the 8-bit level presentation, it actually doesn't play bad at all. You still can upgrade your ride, there's still weapons to slow down your foes, and it moves along at a brisk pace. If you can get past the lack of variety in the sound and visuals, this is still a fun one. I wish they had added a split-screen option though, because this would have been infinitely more fun with two players. Old Clax here was ported to just about everything back then, and pretty much on everything it came on a tiny cartridge of no more than a meg or two. On the Genesis, you get a 2 megabit extravaganza of single screen puzzle action. And it's a strange one. 
A conveyor belt brings you different colored bricks that you must match up by catching and releasing on the play area below. As they come faster, the challenge ramps up quite a bit. Since this relies on the same visuals for the entire game, I'm not really sure what the heck the 2 megabit cartridge was used for. There's not much music to speak of, so not much space is used there. Regardless, this has its moments and can be rather entertaining. Just don't go expecting any change in the whole home presentation. In late 1994, the Genesis got Pack Attack, a 2 megabit puzzle game based on the Namco Classic franchise. This was a weird one because it was so late in the life of the Genesis and still came on such a small cartridge. It only has a handful of songs for each of the modes and the visuals are of course the same single screen repetition you're seeing right now. But like most puzzle games, the draw here is the gameplay and I must admit it ain't bad. The idea here is to play it as a mix of Tetris and Pac-Man, and it actually works. You still need to complete lines, but you must also now use Pac-Man to get rid of those pesky ghosts. If you miss a few, they remain trapped between layers and become difficult to clear out. This does make for an interesting time, particularly the puzzle mode that gives you certain scenarios to clear. You never would have guessed it, but this is one mashup worth a look. In 1991, we got perhaps the strangest of the Pac-Man entries, Pac-Mania. This was also a 2 megabit cartridge and it takes the tried and true formula seen in the arcade and turns it into what the game calls 3D. And it works. Because the play area that is on the screen is much more zoomed in, the entire thing scrolls both horizontally and vertically. This would make you think the gameplay would break because you can't see the oncoming ghost, but this adds a jump to the mechanics to compensate. It very much makes Pac-Man feel different and I enjoyed it quite a bit. The play areas have a fair bit of variety for such a small game and there's more music and sound effects than you'd expect. I don't know, if you hate Pac-Man this probably won't change that, but if you enjoyed the classic, this new view may just reignite your love for it. In 1989, Sega took its Rambo license and released Part 3 for the Genesis, an overhead running gun they developed in-house. This was a personal favorite of mine early in the life of the console, and I put many a night into it for months. It was one of the smaller games from Sega, coming in at just 2 megabits, and playing it today you can see why. Stage details are simple color patterns used over and over, and you are basically killing the same few enemies time and time again. Rambo's animation is simple, and nothing really moves more than a few frames in the environment. In fact, the most impressive part of this one is the third-person boss fights, which come with lots of layers in a much larger version of Rambo. The base game is just running around mazes looking for an objective. You have a knife, bombs, and arrows to defend yourself, and your gun has unlimited ammunition. This one has aged hard in the years since, because there are a number of better running guns on the platform. But in 1989, it was just what I needed for my brand new 16-bit powerhouse. Space Invaders 91 is one of the few titles in this episode where it's 2 megabits is seen as a huge upgrade over the original source material. Here you get a fair bit of music, new animations, new power-ups, and new enemies. It updates the original arcade quite a bit and is pretty fun for it. The core setup mostly remains the same. 
Enemies are attacking you from above and you must destroy each wave to move on to the next level. These enemies are quite a bit more varied than before, both in looks and their weapons. If you enjoyed the original arcade all those years ago, I do recommend this one. The new look, the new sounds, and the additional gameplay enhancements make for a good evening's worth of fun. The only thing missing is a two-player mode, which should have been a given for hardware as powerful as the Genesis. In 1991, Super Volleyball got a release courtesy of Video System, a two-player port of the arcade version of the same name. And you guessed it, another 2 megabit cartridge as well. This is not an easy game to get into. The gameplay takes quite a bit of trial and error to figure out, and boy is it simple when it comes to presentation. Players look the same, just different colors. Arenas look the same, there's just a few musical selections. It's pretty bare bones all the way around, except for the animations. It's here that the most care was put into what you see on screen. Most will balk at its unintuitive gameplay, but it can be fun if you have the time to learn it. Grab a second player and learn it together. Getting crushed by the computer at the start is no fun at all, and it's much more tolerable to play with a friend. Nineteen ninety two saw Tecmo World Cup, a soccer game that was just two megabits in size, and it shows in both the available options and the presentation. But for someone that doesn't follow the sport, I actually enjoyed the simplicity. The two button interface is just for passing and shooting, so there's nothing complicated here to learn. Of course, for those of you that love the sport and want lots of modes, options, and gameplay mechanics, this one is likely shallow as a puddle. Trampoline Terror. Boy did I hate this 2 megabit 1990 release with a passion. The play field is lined with switches that must be walked over to destroy. Find them all to clear the stage. The trampoline part comes with red, green, blue, and yellow squares you can jump on for a boost, but they will eventually break. There's also tiles that disappear and teleport you. There are items called P-Balls on the map that can be used as weapons against the enemies. It's pretty simple as far as graphics and sound, but the gameplay does grow on you. It progressively becomes more challenging, and the strategy needed becomes quite involved. What started out as a what the hell is this moment, evolved into an appreciation for this action puzzler, and I recommend you take it for a spin yourself. Nineteen ninety one was the year that Genesis saw Ultimate Kicks, a port of Taito's arcade original. This came on a two megabit cartridge as well, and like most of the other titles we've gone over, the presentation is super simple. The single screen play area is occupied by only a handful of small sprites and only one major enemy. Outside of the sound effects, there is also no real music to speak of. That leaves the gameplay as the only real source of content here, and fortunately, it is a fun and unique action puzzler. The goal is to rope off sections of the play area without the enemy hitting you. Take back most of the map and you win. While it sounds easy, this one can be quite difficult. The backgrounds do change up as you get to new stages, but they are never complicated, and the only animation you see is the enemies themselves. I like it though, and I think it could be one of the better games in this episode, just based on its unusual premise alone.
The first soccer game I ever played on the Genesis was World Championship Soccer, released in 1989 by Sega themselves. You think Tecmo's game was simple? Boy, you really need to see this one. Looking down on the action, the players have little in the way of animation. You see some little legs pop out on slides and kicks, but nothing much more than that. There's two or three songs here that play at various times, and the content only has a few modes to play. Again, the simple gameplay actually appeals to me because I'm not into teams, stats, and lots of buttons for different actions. Basically, you have a shoot and slide button and a couple of pass options, making for a game that is very easy to pick up and play. This was one of the budget releases when the Genesis launched, and while much better games would come along to represent the sport, I still kind of liked it. In 1990, we got one of the most irritating games I have ever played on the Genesis, Zoom. This was a port of the Amiga original, starring a... Well, I have no clue what the hell this thing is, honestly, but your job is to encircle the grid you're on while avoiding enemies and collecting items. It isn't an awful game, but the near-constant Come On Boy voice that plays really becomes grating. The ideal way to play this is to score more squares in a score so you don't hear the come on boy crap quite as often, but you still get it more than you want. There is a two player game with a few different options, but I really wish it didn't have that digitized voice. At just 2 megabits, maybe it could have been an additional enemy sprite or something a little less irritating. Tetris on the Japanese Mega Drive was to be released in April of 1989, but never made it to retail. Sega cancelled it at the last minute after learning they did not have the rights to release a home version, leading to one of the rarest titles on the platform. This version of Tetris came on a 2 megabit cartridge and is one of the simpler versions of the game in terms of options. It was based on Sega's System 16 arcade version released the previous year, and has a normal and trial mode, plus two player options for each. Visually, the backgrounds are nothing special, the blocks are simple, and the music only has a few entries. It's a curiosity for those looking for unreleased games, but there are far better versions of Tetris out there. Our final game is the Namco developed Ball Jacks, released in 1993. This one was never released in the United States, so I didn't play it until much later. And I really wanted to like it, but man is it hard to play. The idea is to use your robot to grab balls from your opponent's conveyor belt, and keep them on your own. You control the robot's arms individually and can play both offense and defense. Grab the balls or stop the other guy from getting yours. It sounds simple, but you can be hit and damaged, forcing you to repair your robot and wasting valuable time. Visually, this is a very simple game. Play areas change little between the stages, and most of the assets are static as well. Most of its 2 megabits seem to be used for sound effects and music, of which there is quite a bit of. This one is better with 2 players, so I advise grabbing someone to play with to get the most out of it. Playing it alone leads to frustration more often than not. So what's the takeaway here? Are these 1 and 2 megabit cartridges worthless to a modern gamer because of their prosaic presentation and simple mechanics? I don't believe so. 
While these will never win any awards for being some of the better games on the Genesis, a number of them have gameplay that holds up well enough to still be a good time. While the size of the cartridge certainly could matter in terms of content and complexity, the quality of a developer was still far more important. A good team of programmers can take very little space and still make something interesting, and I believe a number of these still qualify. On the flip side, a large game does not equal a great game. There are 32 megabit titles on the Genesis that are just awful. Despite being loaded with digitized images, lots of motion captured animation, and tons of voices and musical scores. I'd also like to remind you that just because a game is listed as 1 or 2 megabits, that's just the size of the ROM chip itself. The game program on those chips can take up even less space than is available, which I think may be the case with many of these titles. Games like Flicky almost certainly use much less than the 1 megabit they were burned on. It's also interesting to see how certain games advanced thanks to the larger cartridges giving a good developer more space to work with. Just look at the jump between games like Streets of Rage 1 and 2, Fantasy Star 3 and 4, and the progression of the Mortal Kombat series. Larger cartridges wasn't an ironclad guarantee of greatness, but in the right hands, it could definitely make a world of difference. I'm Sigalord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.